a sudden realization. The sky and the cosmos are one. The outer reaches of the cosmos are not far away. They are all around us. There is no distance we cannot travel from where we stand right now. Introspection, self-reflection, eyes on the inside. The key to evolution is insight. The truth must really unsought. The understanding of the universe and of the self. The power to mold oneself beyond our natural limitations. Evolution is a state of mind. The Great Ones symbolize our dream of evolution. They represent that which we might become. But not all Great Ones are created equally. And not all Great Ones are ascended equally either. Some Great Ones have left this world. Fueled by their own wisdom and understanding, they have ascended themselves to higher, dreamlike planes of existence, leaving their slumbering bodies behind to be looked after by the Tumerians or whatever worshippers may happen upon them. But that's not all they leave. Ebritus and the Celestial Emissary, among others who were also left behind by the Great Ones that have already ascended, lack the insight to leave their material husks into existing consciousness. The basest of minds among their kin, they are trapped in the basest of planes. The idea of evolution and ascension through insight are represented in-game by the beast's embrace and milkweed rooms, which transform our bodies completely, and by the childhood's beginning, in which we are able to become a great one ourselves, after absorbing the insight granted by the third umbilical cords. Bearing an undeniable resemblance to the babies of Upper Cathedral Ward, who constantly turned their gaze towards her, Ebritus herself would have been born out of a mortal woman, a Tumerian bride inside the labyrinth long, long ago. Ebritus had an emissary, an envoy. Her primary purpose was likely to make contact with the cosmos and the king that left them behind, but she was contacted by a different king instead. The Church is able to turn humans into small celestial emissaries. Not proper great ones, but king, nonetheless. The insight for this procedure was gained through Adeline's rune, which revealed the nature of the celestial attendant. They all share the same goal, communion with the cosmos. Ebritus, the emissary in Rome, another left behind great one, all followed their newfound kin onto the surface where their newly founded liaison would hopefully bring them all closer to the ascended great ones. Adeline's milkweed room, which would be better translated as seedbed, illustrates its connection to the celestial emissary through its mention of lumenwood. In English, this word is a reference to the lumenwood garden where we fight the living failures and is reminiscent of the looming flower garden where we find the emissary. In Japanese, the rune's lumenwood is written as Hoshiwa, which more literally means ring of stars, a description that resembles the appearance of the small emissaries when they assume this particular form. It isn't clear, in the rune, why they translate it as lumenwood, but the name of the location, in Japanese, at the kanji ki, which means tree, while lumen flower adds kusa. Both the lumen wood and the lumen flowers can be found in game in their respective gardens. And the Japanese description doesn't just say become a lumen wood, it says become the trunk or stalk of a lumen wood. The stalk possibly being a figurative connection between earth and sky. Now, the rune also says that you'd house phantasms in your seedbed, and we know what phantasms look like by their depiction in the item Augur of Ebritus. This form can also be seen in the item's madman's knowledge and great one's wisdom, 
symbolizing the insight planted inside one's head. The small emissaries were created by and have become the garden of phantasms, gardens of insight. Has someone, anyone, seen my eyes? And I'd like to mention just one last connection, stemming from these lumen wood flowers, as they can be used to help identify Brita's progenitor. The first, more pertinent clue comes from Mariana's third umbilical cord, when it states that every great one loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate, an Odin. The formless great one is no different. To think it was corrupted blood that began this eldritch liaison. This is a clear indication of the connection between Odin and the Ebritas looking babies, one of which Ariana has just given birth to. And the lumen flowers further corroborate that, since they can be found in Odin's domain, in the Nightmare Frontier. And even though the seawater experiments were inspired by cause, it's fitting that the insight Adeline had gained would bring them one step closer not to Koss herself, but rather to Ebritas, who was kindred to the formless Great One, since Adeline, having been a blood saint once, had corrupted blood coursing through her veins. The water used in these experiments is more commonly associated with a barrier, but it is also, functionally, a medium between planes, a bridge. These experiments and its medium were the bridge that allowed Adeline to access the insight hidden inside her blood. Evolution is a race, and some of them are left behind. The first more instinctive assumption is that humans would need the insight granted by the Great Ones in order to evolve and that all Great Ones would evolve out of their own insight. But not all Great Ones can ascend, and not all Great Ones are ascended equally. Granta's eyes, Nicolas's ramblings, give us an insight into this matter as it states that Rome was given insight by Kos. Looking through this lens, we can establish another category of Great Ones, comprised by those who lacked the wisdom to transcend their physical existence, but that were later given the means to by those who had gone before them. This group includes Rome, Amygdala and the Brain. These are, indeed, Great Ones, inhabiting a plane of existence that is not our own but they lack the ability to create and or shape their own planes of existence being, instead, confined to living on someone else's domain. From here on out, I will refer to these three as lesser great ones, and to those who have ascended on their own, that is, Flora, Kos and Odin, as true great ones. In Bloodborne, eyes are synonymous with insight and visual design serves to distinguish between the three classes. The sheer number of eyes creates a distinction between the lower classes, since the last behind great ones have only two eyes while the lesser ones have many. And the design also signifies a distinction between the lower classes and the true great ones, since the lower ones all have eyes on the outside, with amygdala almost being an exception. Almost because, despite having internal lies most of the time, she still brings them outside in order to use her cosmic powers. Now, to go into more detail on each lesser great one, starting with Amygdala. As previously discussed in my Tomb of the Gods video, Amygdala's domain is the wasteland of Odin's curse, the nightmare frontier. Stationed at the outskirts of the formless Great One's domain, she is both Odin's first line of defense and the keeper of the way into Loren, which was also previously associated with Odin. But as impressive as the godhead may be, 
I think the most interesting lore lies with her counterparts. During our time in Yarnan, we'll meet with other amygdala-like creatures and, despite their similarities, I believe they belong to two separate groups. Let's start by identifying said groups. On one hand, we have the amygdalas that can be found inside Yahar Gu and, on the other, we have the two that transport us to the Nightmare Frontier in the Hunter's Nightmare. The ones inside the Unseen Village seem to stand alongside the bell-ringing women, which led many people to believe they were working with the church, guarding Yahar Gu against trespassers. But, as I have shown in The Hunt's End, these women aren't working with the church and it would stand to reason that the amygdalas aren't either. They were most likely transported here by these ladies' uncanny bells, previously undiscovered left behind great ones, summoned from the dark corners of the labyrinth. They may even have been summoned from the labyrinths of other worlds. They don't seem to be working with anyone, really. Avatars of chaos, brute forced into an already chaotic conflict. Meanwhile, the other two amygdalas stand out from this group in more than one way and they warrant a more thorough investigation. One noteworthy characteristic is that, unlike their more aggressive kin, these two have a very specific purpose. They are gatekeepers. And make no mistake, for this is exactly what they are. Their purpose isn't to keep you out, their purpose is to let you in. They aren't guarding the way into the nightmare, they are the way into the nightmare. If they wanted to keep you from getting there, all they'd have to do is nothing. So, we've established their purpose, but why? Why are they there? They do not wish to take you into the dreamlands. That isn't something they want. If it were, they'd take just about anyone and they'd grab you on sight. But they don't. They only take those in possession of certain key items and that are standing on very specific locations. Their job isn't to let people in. Their job is to let the right people in. Two gatekeepers stationed at two churches transporting those who hold the right invitation to nightmares where the healing church can also be found. These two really are working for the church. A fact that is compounded by one very significant trait that is unique to them, that being the fact that they can speak. They can communicate using human words in a manner that we can easily understand, which directly contradicts the lore of the Great Ones, whose unintelligible utterings need to be translated into pictographs in order to be understood by humans. And from their speech we can discern what seems like two very human-like demeanors, grief and contempt. The grief in Amygdala recites the fisherman's litany and, interestingly enough, the spiteful Amygdala sounds an awful lot like patches. They may be no longer human, but these aren't great ones either. These are man-made counterfeits, whose origin can be traced back to Bergenworth. Here, we can find not only several effigies of the Godhead herself, but also another set of statues that seem to denote different stages of transformation into an amygdala-like creature. This wasn't true evolution, this was but a shadow of what they were looking for, and so, the race continues.
the brain, a great one deemed them worthy. In their search for evolution, vanity keeps them from seeing greatness, even when it stares them in the eyes. Our first encounter with this great one can be described as an exquisite mixture of agony and despair. But, despite being presented as an adversary at first, the brain is not the hunter's enemy. Trapped and tortured, her sight obscured by pain, she will lash out at anything and everything. But if you stand close enough, if you let her see you for what you are, then she will spare you from that frenzied, excruciating death. But what are you exactly to this great one? You, good hunter, are an envoy of the moon. Runes are translations of the great one's uttering Zen. After releasing the brain from her captivity, after making contact with her, she will gift you with one of these runes. This is a translation of this great one's uttering Zen. She only has one thing to say to you. Moon. A lesser great one ascended by the moon presence into a lofty plane of darkness, where she'd safeguard the living string in the way to Flora's to Marion Bride, the Blood Queen of the Labyrinth. This lofty plane of darkness, by the way, was possibly referenced by a call beyond, which can be found in the same area where you learn the make contact gesture. Another very striking aspect of the brain's lore comes in the form of the winter lanterns. Their overgrown, frenzy-inducing heads leave very little room for doubting their connection to the rotten great one. Wandering the dreamlands, they attack anything they can get their hands or eyes on. This behavior mirrors the brains and the lanterns would have been created as another line of defense. But they are more than just a collection of messengers reshaped as the stuff of nightmares, and two of their characteristics easily stand out without the need for scrutiny, their clothing and their singing. They are dressed as the plain doll from the hunter's dream, and their singing eerily sounds like a lullaby. The connection to the hunter's dream serves to further the connection between the brain and flora, in the singing. La, la, la. What's with the singing? Well, the doll itself is a construct, a golem created by flora, and everything she does is by design. So, during childhood's beginning, when she cradles the newborn great one that used to be the good hunter, that behavior is also by design. That instinct, that particular attitude, was built into her for a purpose. Considering the field surrounding Murgo and the doll's behavior when faced with a baby great one, I think she was created as Flora's version of Odin's wet nurse, meant to tend to her once Murgo was rescued from the nightmare. In being a reflection of the doll, the Winter Lantern singing reflects that fact. Rome, the vacuous spider. At first glance, 
it may not seem like there's a lot linking Rome to cause, besides Mikolash's dialogue, but it doesn't actually take all that much to make a more concrete connection. With this in mind, two points must be made. First, Rome can be found in the moonside lake can, despite the reference to the moon. Crossing a water barrier in order to reach her can be used as an argument since Kos is the only true great one to be associated with water. Odin is associated with blood, beasts and poison. Flora is associated with blood echoes and moon-scented hunters. Kos is associated with water and, lest you think this association holds no true meaning, just try and remember that water is the barrier that separates all of the worlds. The second point is made through Willen of Bergenworth. Willen overlooks the Moonside Lake, the place where he said to have buried his secret. And considering that his research focused on seawater, and that by all accounts he was both in possession and made use of Costard's umbilical cord, then he would also serve as a direct link between Mother Cos and the vacuous spider. Pertaining to Rome's origin, the prevailing theory seems to be that she was a human once, a female student of Bergenworth and possibly Runesmith Carroll. The problem here is that, as far as I'm aware, this theory seems to stem entirely from one of Miyazaki's interviews, in which he calls Rome a she. This isn't enough evidence to support such a theory. Being female doesn't imply that Rome was once human and calling her a she doesn't even mean she's female. We do that to all kinds of things, all the time. We anthropomorphize otherwise inhuman creatures and objects in order to make them more relatable. A car's owner could say she's a beauty without actually implying gender. And the Christian god is always called him even though he would be genderless. Without further evidence, this conclusion is just too speculative. There is a point to be made against this theory, though. The childhood's beginning trophy states that you became an infant great one, lifting humanity into its next childhood, and if Rome had been a human turned to great one, then Rome would have been the one to lift mankind, not the good hunter. Now, with that assumption out of the way, the only conclusion would be that Rome was always a great one, and we are free to move on. Like all other great ones, Rome originally inhabited the Tumerian Labyrinth, but seeing that her body can be found in the Grand Cathedral, then she would have followed the choir onto the surface, alongside the Britas in the Celestial Emissary. At some point, she was given, by cause, the necessary insight to leave her physical body behind and to exist only in consciousness, which is to say, in voice only. And from that point forward, she would inhabit the empty dreamland called the Moonside Lake. But why did cause ascend her? After you've destroyed Rome's current form, the Red Moon Ritual is released, and you are presented with the message Ritual Secret Broken, where secret would mean concealment. It is clear, then, that Rome was hiding the ritual, that this was her purpose. But how? To answer that, we must turn to her dead body and to what would later become the Altar of Despair. The Altar itself serves one singular purpose. It turns back time for Annalise, Queen of the Violebloods. Rome's dead body can turn back time. Such a peculiar thing. Unlike it has been speculated before, there's only ever been one Red Moon ritual. The nameless moon presence back on by Lawrence, the note says. Lawrence performed the ritual. Lawrence back on the Red Moon, and in that singular moment, those who had in their possession a cord of the eye were granted their wish of communion 
and each one of them was met in kind by the great one associated with the court they had. And in that moment, Rome was ascended. She can turn back time. Rome is the seal that keeps the ritual. Herself safely hidden inside a bulwark of water that keeps her out of Odom's reach. And with Rome gone, there's nothing to stop the ritual from continuing. The ritual we get to witness is the same one that was started by Lawrence, seen now to its end. Evolution is a prison from which there's no escape. A soul's born gain is a lesson in humility, but it never seeks to berate you during this exercise. Pride isn't always bad, and humility isn't always good. They are both integral to our psyche, and they are only bad when they are misguided. And a soul's born gain seeks to guide you through it. Pride is knowing your strengths and embracing them. Humility is knowing your limitations and getting the help you need. This game's notorious difficulty provides a challenge to be overcome and, with every victory, it provides the player with the opportunity to feel pride in its accomplishment. But, on the other hand, if there's ever a challenge that you can't overcome, the game encourages you to praise the sun, and it will never, ever shame you for it. Following this very same framework, the Soulsborn franchise has always made a point of encouraging the search for knowledge, not only through its stories and characters, but also through the very act of playing these games, since that is the basis upon which the concept of lore hunting is built upon. But they also warn against the dangers of fixating on knowledge that is beyond our ken. They provide you with everything you need to interpret most of the lore. An infinite number of shimmering fragments is offered to the understanding, but they leave a small portion of it enticingly just beyond our reach. The boundary, however, is always clear. You pursue this path at your own peril. In Bloodborne, the quest for evolution is the quest for knowledge, and in this quest, Hubris will lead you to all kinds of bad. The Great Ones are, in part, the knowledge that is beyond our ken, reasonably seen as deities by some of the denizens of this world. There are truly unfathomable aspects about these godlike creatures that we simply cannot understand. This is a limitation that we have to accept, but, like I said, the boundary is always clear and, despite that fact, there is much about them that can be discerned. So, let's pick up our quest and get started, shall we? There was lack of insight, and then there was cause. It's only fitting that this particular Great One would be the one to grant us the most insight into their lore. Mother Cause and her poor, wizened child became the fire that would light the path for Bergenworth's research and that would, someday, consume all of Kanehurst. But doesn't every great one lose its child? Some take this line to mean that all great one infants will be stillborn, doubtlessly inspired by discord granted Manthe's audience with Murgo, but resulted in the stillbirth of their brains. In the Yarnan Stone, which is believed to be the remains of Murgo's body. But the Orphan of Cos proves that this conclusion is wrong. They can conceive a great one, just not in the sense we're accustomed. 
Odin and Flora trying to conceive through Tumerian brides and Murgo's presence in the dreamlands are indications of this. So, what does it actually mean for a great one to lose its child? As we have discussed, ascension is fueled by insight, but if you're ascended through borrowed insight, you're not a truly ascended great one. You lack the understanding to create your own plane of existence and to shape it as you see fit, for example, being confined to an existence inside someone else's domain. True great ones can have children, but they never ascend. They are always left behind. And thus, every great one loses its child. Armed with this knowledge, we are able to create a more complete painting, but I think we can go further still. Something I think you should be asking yourself is, why is Cos dead on that beach to begin with? The phrase goes that every great one loses its child, not the other way around, so there's no reason to believe that birthing the orphan would have killed her. She was found already dead, as the Kos parasite states that the carcass of Kos washed up on the coast. She wasn't killed inland, she died at sea. But a great one is no easy prey, and nothing in those waters could have killed her. Well, the very same item that describes her as being bereft of life is also a part of the answer to this question, the parasites. Though, in order to explain how they come to be, first I have to make a very important statement. Cos isn't dead. The evidence for this conclusion is time. Cos created the hunter's nightmare after the fishing hamlet massacre, but she was already dead when the massacre happened, so she couldn't have been really dead. She couldn't have ceased to exist. Neither then, nor years later, during the Red Moon ritual, when she ascended Rome. That body may have died, but her consciousness lives on. Now, the parasites themselves aren't natural to our world. They weren't swimming in the water and then latched onto her body. To me, they seem to be actual, literal insight. And, once again, Rome serves as a good point of reference for this concept. Rome's actual, physical body is in the Grand Cathedral, so what is the body we fight in the Moonside Lake made of? Rome left her body behind. Only her consciousness remains. That body in the lake is her consciousness. That body is made of insight. So we know now that insight can take a form that is aching to a physical body. We also know that these parasites stimulate phantasms and that the insight found inside the skull of an enlightened man retain the shape of phantasms. And since there is no indication that the villagers of the fishing hamlet would have performed blood transfusions using Kos's blood, especially considering that Kos is never associated with blood, then it can also be inferred that their transformations would have been triggered by the insight provided by the parasites they seem to be harvesting. The parasites are insight, and they came from the body of Mother Cos, a body that is also made of insight. Just like the other two true great ones, Odin and Flora, Cos would have ascended a long, long time ago, another slumbering great one lost in an age long gone. And when she descended to our plane of existence, 
she had to create another body for herself, but her knowledge is not meant for this world, and so it also manifested in the form of parasites, eating away from the inside, just like inintelligible thoughts squirming inside a frenzied mind. She descended in an attempt to keep her child, to stay at her side, but her mind had already outgrown her physical body once, and now a physical body can no longer contain her mind. Every great one loses its child. Now, let's expand these concepts to encompass all other great ones. Starting with a caveat regarding what death means to lesser and left behind great ones. As we have already established, lesser great ones leave their bodies behind, and even though to an earthly outside observer, it would have seemed like they had died, their consciousness remains. The problem comes when this newfound existence in the dreamlands comes to an end, lacking the wisdom to permanently anchor themselves in a higher plane and having nobody to go back to. Killing a lesser great one's insight made body will actually kill it. Likewise, Mikolaj thinks he's waking up and his concern is whether or not he'll remember all of this, but if that's the body he's trying to go back to, then I think he's got more pressing matters to be worried about. Into a left behind great one, death is simply death. By definition, they lack the insight required to ascend on their own, and once their bodies die, they cease to be. The old hunter said, says that one day, the hunters disappeared, meaning they were dragged into the hunter's nightmare in every respect, whole bodies and all. This is not the waking world, as discussed in the last video. This is the nightmare Yarnon where the night of the hunt unfurls, and this is also not an avatar created from thought alone, this is Ebrita's physical body, dragged along like the rest of us. When you kill Ebrita's daughter of the cosmos, she's just plain dead. Moving on, we can start talking about all true great ones as a whole. The first thing to be considered is that evolution is not a two-step journey. Once they had reached the dreamlands, their insight-driven nature would compel them to seek out even higher planes of existence. Their evolution is unshackled. They have gone beyond. For the sake of comparison, the dreamlands are the planes where the lesser great ones are ascended to. And just like Kos created an avatar in order to descend to our lowliest of planes, since she was originally found in the actual fishing hamlet, not the nightmare version of the DLC, so too would the others need to do the same. This process is divided into two stages, an avatar for the base plane and another for the dreamlands. Why is the moon so interwoven with the hunt? Why is the red moon the centerpiece of the red moon ritual? Because the moons are the great ones. The clouds even move behind them. This is not how clouds work in the real world. But then again, like I said before, this is not the waking world. In the base plane, that is, Nightmare Yarnon, they take the form of the moon. Flora becomes the red moon, while Odin takes the form of the white moon. Those are their avatars, ever present, ever watchful, distant and safe. This is the form they can take in the basest of planes without falling apart, like Kos did. Inside the moonside lake, for instance, the red moon can get close enough to crush you under its weight. And with the exception of the experiment that led to her dead body on a beach, 
even Koss seems to take this form. I originally thought she was the sun in the hunter's nightmare and, when I became curious about the sun that is present over Yarnan in the beginning of the game, a friend of mine was kind enough to go in-game and stare at the sun in my stead. And there were craters on the sun, despite its luminosity. This isn't a sun, it's a moon. This is Kos avatar in Nightmare Yarnan, and from it, we can surmise that her avatar in the Hunter's Nightmare is also the moon. At the end of the Hunter's Nightmare, the orphan will reunite with her mother and the moon will set forever. The next stage are the avatars we encounter in the Nightmare of Mansis in the Hunter's Dream. Odin and Flora have already left these planes behind and, in order to come back to them, they create the wet nurse and the moon presence to serve as avatars, lower forms to inhabit in lower planes, bodies made of insight, just like Rom and Amygdala. On the top of Murgo's tower, where the moon is closest, and on the hunter's dream, when the red moon hangs low, they will descend upon us. And even after these bodies have been slain, they aren't truly dead. You're striking at mirrors, reflections, projected from a higher plane. The Great Ones continue to exist in a place beyond. Evolution is unbound. Forces so big that each one of them is literally a world unto itself. A true great one can bend the entirety of its domain to its will. When you are both time and space, what else is left for you to be? A true great one is a world unto itself and the formless one has become the abyss. If you wish to stare into it, you need look no further than to step into the dreamlands. Darkness spreads and the abyss seeks to consume it all. There is an ongoing conflict happening just above our heads, its effects rippling through different realities. We cannot peer into it as our limited perspective fails to pierce the veil that separates us. But in its wake, we can find the signs we need to piece together a picture of the landscape created by this war. The first sign is, of course, the moon-scented hunters and their occupation of slain beasts. The hunters being sent forth by Flora, and the beasts being brought into existence by Odin, as she allows humans to come into contact with the beast within. And then, surely, there is Odin and Flora fighting for possession over Murgo, but both these points are limited. The fight against the beasts could be seen as a human endeavor, even though the previous conflict between Tumerians and beasts should arguably be considered as establishing a pattern. And the fight for Murgo doesn't necessarily set them as enemies, so much as two entities competing for the same prize and only for that single, very specific prize. The first step to change this perspective would be to further separate the true Great Ones into two groups. Like I said in my last video, during my analysis of the carrier runes, there is Odin, and then there is everybody else. Odin and Flora are clearly on opposite sides, but what about Kos? Kos doesn't seem, at first, to take an active stance in regards to any other great one, but there are two instances wherein she shows where she stands. The first is by ascending Rome in order to contain the Red Moon ritual, actively interfering in the ongoing conflict between Flora and Odin. The second instance 
is shown by the end of the hunter's nightmare interference in our world. The hunters that came to the fishing hamlet weren't moon-sainted hunters. They were working for William of Bergenworth on behest of Kainhurst and those of corrupted blood. The beginning of our journey through that nightmare is the end of its story, shortly after the Red Moon ritual had taken place. The beginning of the DLC is the end of the nightmare. After that point, no hunters are dragged into it, blood drunk or not, and no references can be found of it. Neither Alfred, Gascoigne, or the frenzied version of Eileen get whisked away and the only thing that changed is that, after that point, the hunters had been beckoned by the Red Moon. There's no strong enough indication that Cos and Flora would be working together as allies, but there is evidence that they'd see Odin as a common foe. Another way to embolden this division is by grouping each true Great One subordinates according to a scale of aggressiveness. Cos and Flora subordinates are mostly passive, only attacking in self-defense or to arguably help the hunter, while Mikolash and Amidala are, well, let's just say they're not passive at all. And the Red Moon ritual is such a pivotal point in the story. I've talked at length about the circumstances surrounding the ritual, but what exactly is it? The ritual clearly beckons the Red Moon, but I think that, once again, our perspectives have been too limited, as the mass transformation of humans into beasts is usually brushed aside as a side effect with no greater meaning, and even the idea of beckoning the Red Moon doesn't seem to be a fit description of the events. The word beckon implies a consensual response, but I think that, in the context of the game, it is more accurately describing a forced conscription instead. And I don't just mean the word itself, as it is seldomly used in Japanese, but rather the context in which it is used in English. For example, as read on the note found in the hunter's dream, the eye of a blood-drunk hunter is said to beckon hunters to the nightmare, but once the griffin amygdala gets a hold of you, you don't really have much of a choice. Likewise, through the third umbilical cord of the old abandoned workshop, the pale moon is said to have back on the hunters, but there was no dialogue choice at the beginning of the game. Nobody asked us whether we wanted to become hunters or not. We had no choice. And then, there are the two notes talking about rituals to back on the moon, and the moon presence back on by Lawrence. The two of which are clearly talking about the Red Moon ritual. After Ron is killed and the ritual restarts, the Red Moon itself appears first inside the Moonside Lake before its appearance in Nightmare Yarnum. Here, the Red Moon itself is absolutely huge, that is, close, and it comes crashing down on you. It looks a lot more like violently dragged than gently beckoned. Flora was being dragged from its higher plane of existence into the plane of the dreamlands, and then further into Nightmare Yarnum. In the mass beast transformation itself, while being actually a side effect, it is also a reflection of the process that is taking place, with the weakening of barriers that separates these worlds which would, in turn, allow this true Great One to be dragged and bound. The ritual forced Flora to expose herself, her bride, 
and her daughter, Odin, had made her move. She would have her surrogate child. The origin of the ritual, I believe, can also be attributed to Odin. The ritual went bad for pretty much everyone. The humans performing the ritual had no idea of what the real consequences of it would be, but since the outcome benefits only the formless Great One, then it can be speculated that this was the goal of the ritual all along. It is said that Great Ones often answer when called upon, and considering that runes are translations of what the Great Ones are saying, then the overwhelming quantity of runes that are related to Odin would imply that Woden was the Great One that answered the most. Odin was sharing her insight with the healing church, her knowledge. She was teaching them, and she taught them how to perform the ritual that would force Flora out of hiding and allow her to snatch Murgo from the Red Moon. Odin's relationship with the church is implied not only by the runes, but also by the reliance on blood transfusions, the two gatekeeper amygdalas, and the many amygdala-like statues present in the Grand Cathedral. Amygdala herself, of course, been already associated with Odin. And this idea that I have presented, of weakening barriers, of breaching the bulwark that separates planes, can be found all around Odin. Darkness spreads and the abyss seeks to consume it all. While Kos is associated mainly with the water that represents that self-same barrier between words, and while Flora is associated with blood echoes, a more ethereal form of energy found inside the blood, and that seems to be associated with a lower form of insight. The formless Great One is blatantly associated with blood, and also with the poison that contaminates the nightmare frontier surrounding Odin's domain, and the ancient land of Loran, which is also associated with that same Great One. Blood is a medium of the highest grade, in the essence of the formless Great One. Odin hijacks the medium and feeds from the wishes that are found within for, as we all know, a strong will produces thick blood. Not only that, but under her influence, this defiled, corrupted medium allows the host to come into contact with the beast within. More than a plague, the beastly scourge is a symptom that shows how widespread Odin's corruption really has become. And blood is not the only medium being corrupted. Just like Loran's poison would have corrupted the underground lake connecting the Forbidden Woods to central Yarnon, poison would have corrupted the lakes and waterways of the Nightmare Frontier. From the frontier, one can see both the Nightmare of Mansis and the Hunter's Nightmare, and, stealing the frontier, one can also find the creatures shaped like the Avatar of Kos trudging through these toxic lakes, which leads me to believe that these lakes were once filled with water, that this was once a part of the domain that is ruled by Kos, a part of the domain that is Kos. And that wasn't Odin's only hostile takeover. Have you ever asked yourself, how did these cost-looking creatures get to the Nightmare Frontier? The information that I've presented you answered that question as well. They were already there. And what about the brain? 
If the nightmare of Mainsis is Odin's domain, and if the brain is Flora's subordinate, then how did the brain get there? The answer is exactly the same. She was already there. Occam's razor at its best. The nightmare of Mansis was originally Flora's domain and, quite naturally, the brain resided there. Keep in mind that the true great ones exist beyond the dreamlands and what we see here is not their fight, it's an echo of it and that echo is projected across all planes of existence. Its effects are mirrored across all of space and time. Odin, seemingly coming out of nowhere, started by defiling the Queen of Loran. The first death, shared by both Thumeru and Loran, the death where Amygdala waits you, is called defiled Thumeru. That is the death at which Loran defiled Tumeru. After spreading its corruption through the kingdom of Loran, Odin started defiling Flora's domain in the waking world. Both kingdoms fell into ruin, but Odin's presence had taken root, and it would be felt by humans many ages after the start of this war, as Odin's corruption would make its way into their blood as well. I talked once about the choir bell, a mention that I believe the original bell, after which the choir bell is fashioned, may have been used to communicate with Odin. Remember that the silver used to make this bell, and the choir bell both, are associated with Kainhurst, that the effects of the bell were associated with Annalise, and that all of these are associated with Odin. The inhabitants of Loran would have used that original bell to commune with the formless Great One, forging their new Eldritch liaison and resulting in the corruption of their blood. There is an ongoing conflict happening just above our heads, and darkness spreads through the landscape created by this war. When dealing with forces of this magnitude, even their footsteps can be larger than life. The signs of their presence aren't small burst strokes, they are vast and overwhelming. The dreamlands themselves being a reflection of this conflict. Odin's domain has sprawling stretches of land that go far beyond the horizon. The hunter's nightmare of Kos is confined to its recreations of Yarnon in the fishing village, and it is set up almost like it's meant to guide you towards the orphan, a path in a nursery more than a proper domain. And Flora is confined to the hunter's dream, a tiny island surrounded by mist and ever-stretching trees. A figurative gilded cage. The literal last bastion of control of a true great one. A reflection of the losing side of a timeless war. Always under the watchful gaze of Odin's white moon, 
Flora will only risk coming out when Odin's tide of corruption has been temporarily held back. Beasts will have been slain. Fire will cleanse the workshop. Maybe even Odin's avatar, the wet nurse, will have been temporarily destroyed. And Flora will be free to welcome Murgo back into its ethereal arms. But respite will be short-lived. Just like a true nemesis, Odin is the great one who cannot be escaped. Evolution is strife. Here, at the end of our journey, there are only three great ones left to talk about. Murgo, the orphan, and our own good hunter turned to great one after childhood's beginning has taken place. And the only thing left to talk about is what is to become of them. Something that sets them apart, at least in game is the message Nightmare's Lane. It used to be exclusive to the wet nurse in the moon presence, but now it is also presented after defeating the Orphan of Cause. The message could be a reference to the slain avatars of True Great Ones, but even before the DLC came out, that interpretation already had its problems. Considering that the message doesn't appear when the wet nurse is defeated, it appears when Murgo goes to sleep. Now that interpretation is even less reliable since, when fighting against the Orphan of Cause, you get the usual praise slaughtered message for defeating the actual boss, and the Nightmare Slaying message is only presented after striking at the humanoid shadow that has replaced the Orphan standing over the body of Mother Cause which then triggers the DLC's final cutscene, showing that shadow moving towards the moon. It sounds counterintuitive, but I think that the most relevant aspect of this message is not about what you have slain, per se, but rather about what follows. A hunter turned to Great One, and the orphan reuniting with Cos. What follows? is Ascension. Murgo had been held captive by Odin, a sign that Murgo had the necessary insight to ascend beyond the dreamlands and, after she is released from her captivity, Murgo is free to reunite with Flora as well. Remember that Cos and Flora don't reside in the dreamlands. They have left those planes behind and so, in order to be reunited with their mothers, both Murgle and the Orphan would have to ascend beyond. And what about the Good Hunter? Well, the circumstances around the Good Hunter's ascension are unique, and honestly, I don't believe the Good Hunter is ready to become a true Great One just yet. A Great One, yes, but not like Odin, Flora and Kos. We've ascended through borrowed insight, which is akin to a lesser great one. That insight was acquired after consuming umbilical cords we didn't understand, two of them taken from corpses we had killed. Even the player can be used as an argument. We are the good hunter, and despite everything we have learned, there is still so much about the great ones we will never know. No, I don't think the good hunter can ascend beyond the hunter's dream, and I don't think that was the point of it. I think the point of it was to show the possibility, to show that we all could, someday, walk that path too, if only we can find the insight to see it. And the last question in need of an answer. Why do we have to fight the Orphan before she can ascend? She has the insight to ascend on her own. That much is clear. Just like Murgo, whose body died and left behind only the Iron Stone. The Orphan would have died in the hands of the Hunters who raided the village and 
she found her way into the dreamlands. But something seems to be holding her back. She still clings to her mother's body. She leaves it very slowly. She stares at the sky, looking for her mother, and cries. Kos is obscured. The orphan cannot find her. But Kos has guided us here. She couldn't just have brought us directly to her daughter. She had to show us what happened. She had to teach us, to give us the insight. We've been brought here by Mother Cos, not to kill the orphan, but to shed her from all the thoughts that trapped her in this plane. This body is made of insight, of knowledge, of thoughts. And with the understanding that we have gained, we can strip her from all the fear, the sorrow and the rage. After her avatar is shed, she can let go. We have set her free. She can see now the path beyond, the path to Mother Cause. One by one, they leave us behind once more. What lies ahead of them is beyond our ken. Something we can't conceive, even in our strangest dreams. Evolution. Evolution is hope. Hi, I just wanna say, we've done it. You and me, together, we've done it. This is the last episode of the main Bloodborne series. And uh, thank you all very much for joining me in this journey. I have a very special place inside of me for these games, for the lore. And... Uh, your presence and your support, they helped me get here, get through this. It helped me to get it done, you know. Like I said, this is the last episode of the main series. Sekiro is coming out soon, and uh, hopefully that game will consume my waking life. So, I'm not making any dates for videos until after I've seen what Sekiro has to offer. If you have any thoughts or questions or comments, you can reach out. I really enjoy talking about these things and... Yeah, that's it, man. So, thanks again to each and every one of you. Thanks to all of my very few patrons. I'm truly grateful to you guys. Thanks in particular to Vini. He was the first patron and for the longest time the only one. Thank you very much, John. And uh, yeah, I'll see you around. <laughs>